Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and before we get started on tonight's story, I want to let you know about the folks who helped me bring your tale to you tonight. And those folks are NordVPN. So if you watch a lot of videos on this channel, then I'm sure that you know about the horrors of the internet, and your safety online should be one of your top priorities. I know it's mine. So with NordVPN, you can easily secure your online browsing and not have to worry about the dark and terrible monsters online. It's easy to use, you connect with one click, or you enable the auto connect for a zero click protection. It has amazing speed, it's confirmed by speed tests that NordVPN is the fastest VPN out there. And to get your horror movies, stories, and otherwise, you can find streaming platforms at a lower price, or a streaming platform that isn't available in your country. Simply change your virtual location. Plus there's no more bandwidth throttling. NordVPN encrypts all of your traffic, so your internet service provider can't slow down your streaming speeds. So put yourself first, my friends, and go to nordvpn.com slash mrcreepypasta to get a two-year plan plus one additional month with a huge discount. The link is in the description down below. And now, on to tonight's story. I was headed towards the airport to catch a flight, driving down a country road that my GPS claimed would serve as a shortcut when my luck officially ran out. A sudden flat tire caused me to swerve off the road, slamming my rental car into the side of a tree. The airbags promptly deployed and made me fall unconscious. By the time I woke, I realized I had missed my flight. My cell phone service was shit, preventing me from being able to contact the airline and make an adjustment. So there I was, miles from where I was supposed to be without even a spare or a phone to call for. And there wasn't another vehicle to be seen on that dark highway. I was alone, and with no option but to walk. So, that's what I decided to do. My head still felt numb from the impact, my body was hurting, so I wasn't sure that I could make it far, but I was sure I had passed by a crossroads that marked a small rest stop of some sort, so I aimed for that direction. After about 10 minutes of walking, I saw the sign and realized it was actually a mile marker for a township in the area. A small place called St. Lepaldi. Didn't sound familiar, but I figured my best option would be to head in that direction before I lost consciousness. The night seemed darker on this highway, and I felt tired, resting on the side of the road near a ditch as I felt the temperature begin to drop. The weather report had claimed the evening would be pleasant, but to be honest, so far it felt like one long headache. Before I knew what was happening, though, it became a nightmare. I heard this strange bellow coming from the nearby ditch, and it made my hair stand up on end. It sounded like a mixture between a cat and a wolf, and maybe an owl. I stood up and I looked towards the gully, trying to see if there was a wild animal somewhere nearby. The whole area seemed still and deserted, almost devoid of life. As I stood there, a chill filled the air, and I heard the noise again. This time I used my smartphone to peer into the ditch and get a better look. There was definitely something there. Some small creature that was crawling along in the mud, but it didn't look like any beast I was familiar with. As I shone the light on it, it turned its head toward me and I nearly dropped my phone. Its eyes, they... They looked human. In that unexpected moment, I scrambled away and moved towards the road, uncertain that I was safe there anymore. Whatever this thing was, I resolved to steer clear of the side road for the rest of the journey. But each few feet I moved, I swore I heard the creature follow, making its ominous, guttural noises as it crawled along. It felt its eyes were on me as I started to run down the street, desperate to get away from the unnerving thing. I wasn't sure if it was a demented individual or some kind of monster, but the thing moved at inhuman speeds. Even as I spotted a farmhouse on the side of the road and started to dash towards it, someone inside surely could help. I rushed to the doors, trying to make as much noise as I could, but the occupants must have been out for the night because nothing I did stirred them. Quickly, I decided to hide in the barn instead, hunkering down and watching as the shaggy creature approached. I could feel my entire body shivering as I caught a better glimpse of it. His hunched over form sneaking into the shed and watching as it crawled towards one of the cows. Before I knew what was happening, the creature attacked it, grabbing a hold of the bovine and tackling it to the ground. The large animal tried its best to fight, but but before long, the diminutive creature had somehow managed to 
turn it over entirely with its legs up and the confused farm animal moaning as it listened to the strange little creature begin to feast. It sounded like it was killing the cow, but I dare not move for fear that I'd be next. The crunching and grinding of the creature kept going for at least an hour as I hunkered down, finally satisfied and full of meat and milk. The shaggy short cryptid crawled away, leaving me to hide in the hay bales. Truth be told, I was so terrified by what had happened to the cow, I wasn't sure if I felt safe to go anywhere. I was also too exhausted, so I tried my best to get rest in the smelly barn. It was better than whatever nightmare awaited me in the snow beyond. Somehow I managed to fall asleep, perhaps from the shock and the terror that I experienced, but in the morning my dilemma only worsened. I felt something nudge me in my backside, and I groggily awoke sometime after sunrise, staring up to see a dark-haired farmhand holding a sawed-off shotgun in my face. Instinctively, I raised my hands in defense, showing the worker I meant no harm, and they ordered me on my feet with a few harsh words I couldn't make out. It didn't sound like a language I was familiar with. Then they pointed their weapon towards the farmhouse, saying a few more strange things that I, I couldn't understand, but I got the impression that they wanted me to head inside. I obeyed immediately, my body too sore and tired from the night before to argue. Hopefully, whatever creature was lurking around would not still be here in the daylight, I thought to myself. As I crossed the yard towards the house, the unease I felt began to go away when I heard children laughing and saw normal people on the front porch. Well, I say normal, but truth be told, I could immediately gather that these folk were quaint, perhaps similar to Amish or Quakers in their quiet lifestyle. The children dispersed when they saw me, and the housewife went to go get her husband. I stood awkwardly there in the front yard for what felt like an eternity until they both returned. He was a well-dressed man in overalls with a brim hat and a long, scraggly beard. Typical attire for the two faiths that I assumed he identified with, but I didn't want to jump to any conclusions until I had a full story. You lost, son? He asked me. Before I even had a chance to respond, he raised his hand for me to come inside and offered... Wife just finished making us porridge for breakfast. Come sit us, Belle. Tell us how you came to our little town. As I ate the warm food, I recounted my tale to the couple, although I left out the parts where I had seen the strange creature that had attacked their cattle. I didn't want to seem insane, and I wasn't sure if the experience I had was actually even real. They sat and listened quietly, and the husband, running his fingers through his beard, thoughtfully as I concluded the story. Uh, you're lucky you found us. Winter comes quick around these parts, and it's harsh and it's cold. Any day now, the ground will be covered with snow, and travel will be impossible. You can stay with us as long as you like. You have plenty of room. It won't be very neighborly of us to send you away, he declared. The wife was nodding and bobbing her head in agreement as I checked my phone. Of course, no reception way out here. I shouldn't have been surprised. For all I knew, because of missing my flight, I had likely wound up losing that job. So a vacation in the sticks wasn't exactly on the agenda, but I figured it was better than drowning my sorrows in liquor back home. As we finished the meal, the couple instructed me to leave my bowl on the floor of the breakfast room, which I found a bit odd, but I did as they told me before I was shown the guest room. The wife rattled off a few rules, such as no food in bed, no candles burning at night, I figured they were just customs that related to traditions of their faith, so I told her I would try my best to remember. As I settled in, I looked out the window and saw just as they predicted. Winter clouds were forming over the farmland fast. Soon it would begin to snow ever so gently, and I saw the two of them out in the front yard apparently having an argument. As I watched the husband and the wife become more heated with one another until at last he announced he was going to town for a drink after smacking her across the face. Somehow, despite the obvious patriarchal system I had seen so far, the act surprised me. This picture-perfect little slice of heaven seemed to have cracks after all, I thought. I also was certain I saw another shadowy, shaggy monster dragging a lamb off into the nearby woods. 
poor tiny animal bleeding as the wife watched it happen impassively. Her face told me I wasn't simply seeing things, whatever the strange troll was, it was real. I kept myself as busy as I could the remainder of the day, offering to help with chores and do anything that would keep my mind off the strange things happening around the area. But as the day lingered on, I saw more evidence something terrible and unnatural was occurring in this small town. I was helping put the dishes away for the midday meal when I grabbed the plate with some leftover chicken to throw it away, and, and the wife stopped me short. You mustn't bother, she whispered. Her eyes were filled with fear as I lingered near the trash can. I hadn't spoken about the creature to her yet, and I could tell that she wasn't likely to tell me much, but still, I felt the need to get answers. There's something living in the woods. I've seen it. I said, as I placed the plate back down. Her eyes twitched, and she looked away. I must prepare for Jonah to return home. Much work to be done, she answered, as she flitted away to another room. Outside, I saw the snow was falling more rapidly now, covering up the roads. But I could see strange footprints out there, moving about the farmland. Evidence of creatures that seemed to be using this area to their heart's content unhindered by any person. I saw one of them enter the kitchen soon after this thought crossed my mind. It moved like lightning to the leftovers the farm wife had given out. It chomped and it licked at the pan, its wild eyes glaring up at me, daring me to stop them. I could see from their snarled and broken teeth that the creature was ravenous for food. It looked like it wanted to rip me limb from limb. I reached for a knife to defend myself, only for the wife to grab my wrist and pull me back to the hallway. You mustn't disturb them, she whispered, repeating the instructions as I saw something long and skinny crawl from one of the cabinets. This one looked even more malnourished than the others, its lanky form hardly able to pull its body across the floor. The other creature began to snarl, protecting the leftovers as best as it could. And I watched in disbelief as the two monsters fought, biting and snapping at one another, ripping the flesh off their scrawny bodies. Perhaps what was most frightening about them was... How much like children they looked. Starved, naked children that had turned animalistic. The woman kept me still until they had left into the cold, and I I dropped the knife, my heart beating wildly. What the hell are those things? I shouted at her, but she was too petrified in fear to say a word, and insisted we wait for her husband to return. When Jonah made it back to the house that night, the dark clouds covered the sky, but the ground was illuminated by the snowfall. We heard the other trolls moving about the land, attacking animals and neighbors, just the same until he made it in the house. As we ate just a little bit of porridge and yogurt, the rest of their food pantry was barren and dry. I felt the need to break the ice in the conversation. How long have you been dealing with these demons? I asked. My stomach was growling for the lack of food, and I knew why. This entire town was living in fear of these creatures, letting them run amok. The husband drew in his breath and put his bowl on the ground just as I had finished talking. We heard loud roars against the door, slamming and opening them over and over again, making everyone on edge as I saw several of the trolls crawl into the kitchen and steal what little food we had left. As the demons took our dinner away, the husband explained the situation as best he could. They come when the snow hits the ground. There are at least a dozen of them. Some speculate perhaps there are more out there in the woods, but they take what they want, and in exchange, they let us live. He whispered solemnly, even as one of the ghastly creatures licked pudding and yogurt right off of his beard. He did his best not to flinch. We protect our young ones by abiding by their rules, keep others from being attacked or punished by their cruelty, he added, as the banging came to a stop and the creatures fled out the door again. But your children starve. Your town does. I could tell just from your wife and your children that they need, they need to have food or they won't make it through the winter, I argued. 
He pursed his lips, obviously not wanting to reveal another nasty detail of the story, but I wasn't having it. This madness had to stop. Who's in charge of this village? We should round up all the men, find these things, and, and kill them, I told them both. And risk their wrath. Possibly kill even more innocent lives? You're an outsider. You don't want to attempt to dictate how we live. Jonah snapped back as he slammed his fist on the table. <clears throat> the whole kitchen got quiet as he cleared his throat and added, Snow's become heavy this year, and therefore our sacrifices will be greater. The elder of our village has chosen to throw a festival to the spirits of the earth, which watch over us tomorrow. And once we finish this ritual, the demons will leave us alone. I saw the wife's face get pale as something unspoken was left out of the conversation, but I decided not to press the matter any further. I was sure the rest of the small village would likely follow the same strange rituals as these folks. And I was considering simply leaving. That opportunity never came, though. During the night, the little creatures came back, this time more numerous than ever, clattering against doors, snarling against the windows. The children cried themselves to sleep, and I hardly could close my eyes for fear of them simply entering the house and doing whatever they pleased with me. I kept the knife that I had hidden away under my pillow that night, as the monsters roam freely, determined to escape this nightmare the next day. But I was so exhausted from the ordeal, I... I don't recall much about the morning except Jonah rising and telling the children to dress as though they were attending a Sunday sermon. You'll be joining us as well. It'll be safer than remaining here, the wife explained. I saw genuine concern for my well-being in her eyes, so I decided to not question. I was actually a bit curious to see what sort of ritual the town folk might perform that would appease these creatures, so I followed them down the snow-covered roads towards the main marketplace. The rest of St. Lepaldi was just as quaint and simple as I expected, a testimonial to their refusal to connect to the modern world. I wondered as we got closer to the town square if this was because of the creatures or something. I saw villagers in their homes and businesses peeking out, all dressed in either their Sunday best or some kind of colorful costume that reminded me of Santa's elves. As we approached the center of town, I soon realized why they all seemed to be shaking in their boots. There was a massive stone statue there of a giantess. Carved in the finest rock, this side of the main coast, and surrounding her I saw artistic representations of the twelve demonic children that I had seen over the course of the last few nights. The entire square had been shoveled free of snow, to all for a platform to be built around the statue, along with long, tall torches and metallic iron cages that lined the corners of the square. In three of those cages I saw people, naked and shaking from the cold of the elements, screaming to be let loose even as their leaders of this small villa calmed the crowd. Brother Jonah, have you brought our final sacrifice, the fruit of the country? One man asked. I have, Lord. He stands before you now, Jonah responded. Then I suddenly realized my role in this festival. I was not invited as a guest. These people were about to sacrifice me to this massive stone edifice. As soon as the realization hit me, I tried to run, but Jonah pushed me down to the gravel and shoved his boot on my chest. It's better if you don't fight it, stranger. Your presence here was a blessing from our giants to prevent my family from losing anyone. The Lord of the Snow gave us you, he explained. Several burly men tied me with ropes and placed me in a cage to the right as the elders continued to make a speech, passing out bowls and other utensils to the crowd. Brothers and sisters, our harvest has drawn to a close. The shadow of snowfall is overcast and the spirits of the earth must be appeased. Let us pray now to them that our township remain under their watchful eyes. Let us ask them for forgiveness for walking on their land. The entire crowd began to chant and moan and bow before the statues as several men lit the cages on fire. Starting to my left, 
I desperately looked towards the husband and wife for some kind of help, knowing I would soon be engulfed if they didn't act. Great Gryla, lady of the hills and devourer of flesh, wife to our sleeping saint and mother to the thirteen demons, come forth and feast upon these sinful children of men. Let their flesh atone for our year of waste, our forgiveness be upon their deaths. I heard something shake and rumble, and I saw that the stone statue seemed to be moving on its own, suddenly taking life as the entire town shrieked and trembled. The giantess grumbled and reached down, crushing the first cage with her strong hand as she snarled loudly. Her children came to life next, snickering and snarling into the crowd as they attacked random townspeople. Their elder chanted that they would be allowed to feast on any they pleased. I knew I would be the next meal for this cult of mad followers, and I begged the family that they let me stay with them for help. But they were so aghast with the ceremony, they paid me no heed. I crouched down as the giantess crushed the top of the cage, giving me mere seconds to run. I, I leapt from the trap and raced across the snow, the older men of the town shouting to hunt me down. I didn't stop for anything. I bolted from the town towards the woods, hiding in the tall grass as the demonic children continued to attack all the villagers that they had pleased. I couldn't stop to reflect on the hellish nightmare as I gathered my strength, and I kept running. I kept running into the night until my power failed me. And when I awoke, I was on the road again, covered in blood and mud and snow. A passing car asked if I needed aid. I saw I had made it all the way back to the crossroads, and I thanked them for the help, barely able to crawl into the back seat. As I got my rest, I asked them where they were headed, hardly even considering their response important at first. The driver checked his GPS, the instruments glitching, as he admitted, uh, Well, I'm, I'm a bit lost. I just considered going towards that township for some help. I grabbed the back of the car seat, my wide and frantic eyes pleading that he didn't. You mustn't go there. All right, just keep driving. Even, even if it's all night, you stay away from that dreadful town. As he turned around the vehicle to go the other way, I heard the howl of a cat off in the woods. And I shivered in panic. Snow was coming down harder than ever as we left. Now I only hope that we made it far away from this madness. Before another nightmare took shape. Hey there, kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and it's the end of today's video or today's episode of the podcast, which means I want to tell you guys thank you so much for watching. If you guys are looking for some cool Christmas or holiday things, I got books. Hey, the Creepypasta Collection Volume 1 and Volume 2 are available now on Amazon. If you haven't seen those, they're years old, but hey, I uh, might as well talk about them, right? Also, I've done a whole bunch of books for Audible. If you guys are interested in hearing more of my voice, Tales from the Gas Station, Volume 1, 2, and 3 are all available on Audible. And if you use the link in the description down below, I think you can actually get uh, your first month for free. So that's, that's uh, cool. cool. Give, the, give the gift of, of uh, uh, my voice. I want to give a very big thank you to everybody on Patreon, especially... Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Stephanie Butler, Brian Arce, Bobby Carmen, Tristan Pelton, Chance Burnett, Diana Krause, Crazy Kid, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Ika Limchok, Dirt Diver 030, Robert Schonkwiller, USMC, Matt Bach, Jables Raz, Mask Note, Joshua Mullen, Dan Pham, Matthew McNeese, Ben Spates, Jeremy H., Raltazal, Ficamel, Nana, The Morgan, Nick Weaver, Melted Lake, Tali Sue, Sky Mara Ravenswood, William King, Reaper 61167, Darth Miver, Michael Ortiz, Satanic Aries, Isodo Hatred, Nessie, Ronnie Hansen, Parafa Panda, Bardo Hawk 764, Lambda M98, Harley, Billy Morrow, Sashi Sazaku, at Grizzly Olsen Pro, My Body Sounds Like Rice Krispies, Jay, Miss Xandra, Suji Campbell, Stricken, Azreen Fox, Fried Chicken 12, Freddy Krueger, Happy Birthday, Jason Willis, Infernal One, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Hades Nephew, Tater Chip, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Cryptic Nightmares, Kiri the Sloth, Tommy Green, Fester's Lampshade, Sky Harbor, Nico Kyle, Rafael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, Trey Smiles, and Corey Kenshin. Like I said, I, I cannot thank you guys enough. 
for being a part of this. And that goes to everybody down there in the description and everybody who even can just support for $1. Thank you guys. Thank you guys. Thank you guys. I hope you all have a wonderful holiday season and sweet dreams. <laughs>